Uh, today I'm going to give a presentation on clinical versus radiological findings in minor hamstring injuries. And this presentation is based on a commentary written by me that was published in the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine in the year 2018. So background of this presentation, we all know that muscle injury is the principal type of injury among athletes participating in explosive power and endurance events, and hamstring injuries account for majority of these cases. A three-year observational study among track and field athletes revealed that hamstring injuries account for 24% of all injuries and around 70% of all muscle strains of the lower limb. Just a brief catch up with anatomy. In this slide, it is evident that semimembranosus muscle that has its proximal tendon attached on the lateral side of the ischial tuberosity, while the common tendon for semitendinosus and biceps femoris attached to the medial side of the ischial tuberosity. And this slide shows cadaveric dissection of hamstring muscles. You can see that the semimembranosus is more a ribbon-like muscle, while the semitendinosus is slightly thinner and it attaches along with the long head of biceps femoris on the ischial tuberosity with its proximal tendon. Hamstring injuries can be classified depending on causative factors as contact and non-contact injuries. And among them, the non-contact injuries is further classified into stretching type and sprinting type based on the injury mechanism. The location of injury could be in the muscle belly, muscular tendinous junction or tendon, proximal or distal, or it could be in the medial or lateral hamstring muscle. The location of injury can be assessed with clinical examination as well as radiological investigation of the injured site. As for any muscle injury is concerned, clinical examination involves eliciting reproduction of the pain with resisted isometric contraction and passive stretch of the muscle. That is active movement in one direction and passive movement in the opposite direction will cause pain in case of a muscle lesion. And you can elicit tenderness on palpation and you can also quantify an active extension def deficit of the knee in case of hamstring injuries. Indeed, you can also observe bruising in the region of the injured side in severe muscle injuries. Objective measurement of the deficit in active knee extension has been reported to be better predictor of the speed of clinical recovery and risk of re-injury in elite athletes with hamstring injuries when they were confirmed with an ultrasound imaging. This slide shows clinical examples of complete avulsion of the hamstring. On the figure A, you can see extensive thigh swelling and dramatic bruising or ecchymosis three days after complete hamstring avulsion in an athlete. And the figure B shows delayed pre presentation of complete hamstring avulsion with the deformity in the contour of the hamstring muscle that comes as a deformity with resisted isometric contraction of the muscle. You can see the muscle popping up with resisted isometric contraction following complete avulsion. There are some other classifications based on the deficit in active knee extension range of motion of the injured limb compared to the uninjured side. And it has been classified as mild if the deficit is less than 10 degrees, moderate 10 to 25 degrees, and severe more than 25 degrees. There's one more classification that classifies muscle injuries of the hamstring as grade one if the deficit is less than 10 degrees, grade two, 10 to 19 degrees, grade three, 20 to 21 degrees. 9 degrees and grade 4 more than 30 degrees of active knee extension deficit. There's one more classification based on the period of absence from sports training, which categorizes hamstring injuries as minimal or slight in case of three days absence, mild four to seven days, moderate eight to 28 days, and severe if the absence from sport is more than 28 days. Here comes the imaging classifications. There's a fairly recent new classification for acute muscle strains based on imaging that addresses specific localization of the site of injury as proximal, middle, and distal. There's another categorization for muscle lesions as intramuscular, myofascial, perifacial, myotendinous, or a combination of these. There's one more famous classification called as modified Petons classification for imaging diagnosis of any muscle injury, including the hamstring injury. 
Here, grade zero refers to no muscle pathology abnormality detected in imaging. Grade one refers to lesions involving less than 5% of the cross-sectional diameter of the muscle that's accounting for two millimeter to one centimeter maximum of the cross-sectional diameter with an evidence of edema showing a feathery pattern, but without any architectural disruption. So for grade zero and grade one, there is no architectural disruption. Grade two refers to partial muscle tear with edema, hemorrhage, and architectural disruption involving five to 50% of the cross-sectional diameter of the muscle. Grade three refers to complete muscle tears or tendon rupture with complete retraction of the muscle tendon. So on MRI, hamstring injuries show aberrant T2 weighted hyperintensity or edema of a muscle or tendon without or with partial fiber disruption. As I told you before, if it is without fiber distortion, then it is called as grade one. With fiber distortion, it is called as grade two. While grade three injuries present with complete muscle rupture or tendon avulsion. The most predominant feature is identification of T2 hyperintensity at the site of muscle injury in order to declare a positive MRI finding for the hamstring injury. Just a few tips for interpreting T1 versus T2 images on MRI. Usually on T1 images, only fat tissue is white, while on the T2 images, both fat and water are white. So what usually they do, they try to do fat suppression on T2 images to show hyperintensity belonging to water or edema or fluid that is presenting in the injured muscle tissue. So this slide shows an MRI image that is coronal fat saturated push, a proton density magnetic resonance image, which demonstrates a strain at the proximal musculotendinous junction. Here's the arrowhead den denoting that of the long head of biceps femoris accounting for more than 60 millimeter longitudinal length. So based on P-trans classification, it accounts for grade one hamstring injury. And this player subsequently sustained a second injury during the same playing season. You can see there's an increased dimension of the strain that is demonstrated in the figure B with the feathery edema pattern. It, uh, it uh, again falls under grade one P-trans classification. And this slide shows images for Another case, you can see on the left, a coronal fat saturated proton density image, which is showing a lesion with edema that is of feathery pattern. And you can also see at the margins of the musculotendinous junction without any discernible muscle fascicle discontinuity. Still again, it falls under grade one, Peton's classification for hamstring injury. And you can see axial, fat saturated proton density images on the right side and these white hyperintense signals refer to edema in the muscle. And this slide shows an example of muscular tendon junction strain of distal semitendinosus muscle and this image is the sagittal one on the left and you can see coronal image B on the right and you can also see Coronal image, sorry, axial images on C and D. In the axial images, you can also see there's a scar tissue here that is highlighted with an arrow mark, the same patient, that is of long head of biceps femoris. MRI findings could assist with correlating the extent of deficit in neuromuscular performance with that of morphological changes in injured hamstrings. For instance, Isokinetic strength deficits of the injured leg compared to the uninjured leg and MRI signs of muscle injury are evident in the injured hamstrings at return to play. So don't forget that there could be a deficit in the neuromuscular performance which could be correlated with the imaging diagnosis. So one such example is strength deficit that could be noticed in the injured leg compared to the uninjured leg along with some signs of MRI muscle injury which is nothing but increased T2 signals or T2 hyperintensity are written to play. So here I have provided a table. It might be congested to read, but please go through the reference that I projected in the beginning of the presentation. So this table summarizes 
studies reporting positive and negative imaging findings for individuals with a clinical diagnosis of hamstring injury. Okay. I looked around 15 studies that have been published in the past two decades. The sample size ranged from 10 to 300 in these studies. And among them, there are signs of negative findings in cases accounting from 5% to 45% maximum in MRI ultrasound or MRI and ultrasound. So that could be a substantial number of cases presenting with negative MRI findings or ultrasound or MRI and ultrasound findings, even though they have been clinically diagnosed with a hamstring injury. So what could be the reasons for these clinical findings that are paradoxical to the radiological findings? Some of the causes for MRI negative findings in cases with a clinical diagnosis of hamstring injury might include pain referred or emanating from the lumbosacral spine or entrapment of the sciatic nerve or the injuries indiscernible within the threshold of the MRI sensitivity. Some people even suggest to do a contrast with gadolinium, but it's always not discernible even with contrast medium if there is a minor hamstring injury. It is plausible that minor hamstring injuries may not be discernible with MRI and ultrasound. Sometimes a positive finding for hamstring injury on MRI may not be detected with ultrasound or vice versa. The imaging investigations are recommended for predicting recovery following rehabilitation for only severe hamstring injuries, but not for mild and moderate hamstring injuries. Because usually clinical prediction to return to place serves better in such cases. There's one study that reported lack of recurrence of clinical grade one hamstring injuries with negative MRI findings that refers to modified Peterns grade zero in the same season. So presence of MRI negative findings in case of clinical diagnosis of hamstring injury seems to be a positive prognosis for those cases. Around 90% of athletes with clinically recovered hamstring strain injuries or cleared for return to play have been found to exhibit elevated signal intensity within muscles on MRI sensitive fluid sequences and 34% showed signs of new fibrous tissue formation. All that I want to make clear is that even though the patients with hamstring injuries are cleared for returning to sport, still they have some, some signs of muscle injury on the MRI, which is identified as increased T2 signal or T2 hyperintensity. Always there will be signs of new fibrous tissue formation at the time of return to play for most of the cases. So there is no complete signs of healing on the imaging, though they have clinical signs of healing to return to play following an injury of the hamstrings. So it must be noted that normalization of this MRI signal intensity does not seem to be a mandated recommend for return to play. And it doesn't fall under any of the recent recommendations that you need to use MRI for detecting return to play at the time of healing. However, it should be remembered that imaging investigations can be used as an adjunct to correlate or confirm clinical diagnosis of a physical impairment that appears in cases not only for hamstring injuries, even it holds good for other muscle tenderness injuries in different cases for other joints and muscles. And one should not forget that even asymptomatic individuals can present with structural abrasions of proximal hamstring strain tendon in imaging studies, but not present with clinical symptoms that require an intervention. So it's quite common to see people presenting with radiographic abnormalities of the tissues, but still they do not present with any clinical symptoms that indeed mandates an intervention. We should not forget that the imaging investigations are not always needed or feasible whenever clear clinical diagnosis of a minor hamstring injury could be established. Based on a clinical examination, both subjective and objective examination, and also based on your clinical reasoning. So along with clinical assessment, magnetic resonance imaging could be useful for moderate to severe hamstring injuries, accounting for P-trans rates Two, that is partial distortion of the architecture of the muscle, and grade three for complete rupture or avulsion of the muscle for guiding the management decision 
monitoring the course of treatment and predicting the recovery time for such injuries. And especially it is mandatory for those people who are at an elite athletic level or professional athletes, it is quite important for them. However, MRI negative clinically diagnosed minor hamstring injuries can be pragmatically treated as hamstring injuries in the absence of differential diagnosis for posterior thigh pain. So take home message, clinically diagnosed minor hamstring injuries that of my minimal or moderate grades, which accounts for less than 28 days of absence for sports participation or grades one and two based on active range of motion knee deficit might remain indiscernible a conventional MRI ultrasound that is modified p grade zero, that is for radiological imaging, which accounts for no structural abnormality or signs of a T2 hyper intense signal seen on the MRI. And these could be classified as simply non-structural injuries. And MRI could not be and could be used to determine the anatomy and extent of the injury, tailor the management to the individual, and monitor the course, residual signs of healing, long-term remodeling, and injury recurrence of moderate and severe hamstring injuries. So take a message is that imaging is not always needed. And in case if it can be used, it can be used and adjunct for your clinical examination. And definitely, if there's a need for surgery, they will definitely do an imaging investigation. And for severe grades of injuries, it could also be helpful to monitor the anatomy and extent of injury and also tailor the treatment and can be used to predict the return to play, but it's not mandatory to use that for returning, predicting return to play following hamstring injuries. And thank you. And if you have any questions, please do ask me. Thank you, Dr. Ashokan, for yeah, the session. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much for that session on clinical versus radiological findings, a paradox in diagnosing minor hamstring injuries. So request the participants. If you have any questions, please ask the resource faculty. Any questions are welcome. I didn't cover everything for hamstring injuries. I don't know. I just kept it restricted only to clinical versus radiological findings following hamstring injuries. Nobody has a question. Okay, okay but um, if you still have questions, you can go and read the article that I sent. And if you have want any more references for the presentation that I had today, you're welcome to ask me. You can get my email from Dr. Selvam or you can use my social profiles to write to me. Yeah, so if you don't yeah I'm just, yeah, I request the participants before leaving the meeting. I'm just posting the reading material, what Dr. Ashokan was referring to. I'll be posting shortly in the chat box. Please wait for that as well as please provide your feedback before leaving the meeting. In the meantime, you can please feel free to ask questions. Okay, if you don't have questions, I will try to project some more information, uh, but I'll wait for questions for a few more minutes, or I will give you some more information on the difference between stretching type and running type of hamstring injuries. Do you have any questions? Okay, I haven't heard any questions, but I will give you some more information. Okay, okay this is yes, please. Okay. Uh, so my name is Umang. 
Uh, yeah. I have a question regarding uh, high hamstring strain and low hamstring strain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so while diagnosing, uh, so how mm -hmm. will you go on? Is just based on the area of pain and the type of injury, or uh, anything is there to differentiate between both of them? And the rehabilitation, how yeah. will it differ for both of them? Okay, so. If you go through the literature, actually, most of the time when we go with the clinical diagnosis of hamstring injuries, we look at the site of pain, especially it holds good when the patient has having an acute injury, okay? So you can go with the site of pain, uh, there are some tenderness on palpation, and uh, those things could be used correlated clinically with the imaging, obviously, when you have an imaging. If it does not happen that way, just you have to go with the clinical prediction based on that location of the symptoms. But does it always hold good when the patient is having a chronic injury? That becomes a problem. Uh, or recurrence of injury again. So if you want to have specific diagnosis of the localization of the tissue injury, obviously you need to wait for uh, the imaging diagnosis exactly to look at, or else you have to go with only the clinical interpretation. That was the localization of the symptoms. And you asked a question actually, how it's going to differ between the proximal and the distal injuries. Okay. Uh, I would put it this way actually, again, it depends on the mechanism of injury that is going to cause the uh, lesion. Okay. So most of the times, if you're going to look at I'll give you some information. I'll project it. Um, okay. Um, and this is based on another clinical commentary published in JAWS PT by Brian et al. in 2010. So based on the injury mechanism, we can just see that for running types of mechanisms, the running at maximal or near maximal speed that occurs following sports involving high speed running or sprinting, the most of the time, the lesion is in the biceps femoris and long head, and the secondary muscle could be the muscle tendinosis, so semitendinosis. And location is more proximal, greater than distal. And when it comes to stretching type of injury, when you do a kicking or slight tackling or doing a dancing, all those things, the most common muscle that is involved is semimembranosis. Again, the tendon that is involved is proximal and more of muscular tendinous junction. And there could be chances for a delay in healing when there's a problem in the ischemia, when there's a problem with the muscle blood supply, or there could be an ischemia, or more related to the tendon, or where there's a lack of blood supply, that could be or avulsion, that could be a problem. Uh, if there's a complete, if it's a grade three avulsion and grade two, there could be need for surgery, especially for grade three, if the patients are of, of elite athletic level, or they're more into sports participation, and they require more uh, rehabilitation to quick return to sport. That could be one form or can manage it conservatively. But never forget that you need to always look for symptoms that are originating from lumbar sickle spine or other structures that could cause the referred pain to these ones actually. And depending on rehabilitation, and again, depends on the extent of injury and type of management that has been gone uh, to the patient, it has to be decided based on that. Um, and uh, as I told you people before, Return to sport, you cannot rely on complete resolution of the symptoms based on imaging. There could be some amount of T2 hyperintensity even after resolution of clinical symptoms. The patient present with, presenting with increased T2 hyperintensity and need uh, fibrous tissue form formation leading to scar tissue within the muscles, actually. Um, there could be a difference based on the uh, grade of injury for the rehabilitation and uh, depends also on the integrity of the muscle tissue. Uh, rather than just classifying as proximal and distal lesions of, for the muscle. Or better, you can think about the other way. You can look at proximal or distal, and you can also look for whether it could be muscle tendinous junction, tendon, or it's going to be the muscle that is involved actually. And if you want more, then I would definitely recommend you to go and look at the readings or published literature based on the type of... Um, mechanism or injuries and type of management that could be different for that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, there is another question from Mr. Marimoto. Yes, sir. No problem. Uh, Marimoto, can you please come online and you can ask your question? Mr. Marimoto. Okay, uh, his question is, how do we manage the hamstring muscle for children with a disability who have genu recurvatum? I think his uh, audio is not working. 
so he has just messaged in the chat box so i'm just asking question on his behalf how do we manage the hamstring muscle for children with disability who have genu recurvatum okay he's asking how do you manage the hamstring muscle for children with disability who have genu recurvatum so disability is quite a vague term term for me actually so probably if you're talking about uh, neurological impairments with the patient uh, just having cerebral palsy or it's going to be a disability that is associated with a neurological impairment or just like musculoskeletal so obviously the management will differ in these cases based on the type of etiology that you call prefer to call it as disability um so again it comes to the point whether the type of injury is going to be localized only to the muscle or is going to be an avulsion along with the part of the muscle being avulsed along with the tendon uh, from the bone tissue to and um, I, I would like to emphasize that today's presentation is not exclusive man on the management of the hamstring injury but still I would give to give you some idea idea based on that so you asked about hamstring injury again never forget that it depends on the grade of the injury it could be but if it's associated with spasticity it's entirely different case that we need to look at in a different pattern or different way to treat it if it's purely musculoskeletal injury but you're talking about genu recurvatum uh and also if that's a genu recurvatum always you never forget that you have to look for generalized hyperlaxity of the whole body there's something called as baitens score that you need to look at um if there is uh, a high, uh, genu recurvatum along with the injury but still we need to know the mechanism of injury that caused it and uh, i i uh, by treating my hamstring injury any genu recurvatum cannot be addressed because the patient is having generatum before it need they need to depend on some osteotomy or some other procedures to correct it um i don't know whether there should be a specialized way of treating hamstring injuries and genu recurvatum probably you need to go and look at some references specifically for that but never forget that as it's a muscle injury you need to look at the uh, extent of muscle injury or the grade of muscle injury and decide the management based on that and if it's a neurological case maybe you need to manage its spasticity along with that hope it answers your question to some extent but i know it's not extensive and explicit but i would recommend refer you to go through the um, concern literature for that i'm not a specialist in that though okay yeah dear participants uh, i have just posted the reference material what dr ashokan was referring to as well as i have just posted the link to provide a feedback so request you all to ask questions if you have any okay so marimuthu has posted one more question okay my question was like it is always going to be stretched and genu recurvatum so how to manage that he is asking okay how to manage the genu recurvatum so i i will i i would like to ask you people at, okay i'm asking you the same question to you what you could do if there's some stretch of the muscle you need to keep it in a shortened position actually am i right that's what you need to think about so what are the various ways you need to so you need to alter the line of gravity that is passing more anteriorly you have to bring it somewhat behind the knee joint if you do or maybe through mid line or slightly behind to do that so what you could think can be a solution that you could think of actually so maybe you can use an orthotic in the foot that could alter the line of gravity that is passing more anterior or you can just use a brace in the knee that corrects the range of knee motion that could be so one you can focus directly on the knee using an orthosis or you can start focusing on correcting some orthotics with the foot okay so that could cause an anti shift or uh, sorry uh, from uh, from an anterior it can move the line of gravity slightly posterior that could cause um less uh, genu recurvatum but still you need to know whether it's unilateral or bilateral for the patient and based on that you need to design if it's bilateral you can think about interventions cause uh, concentrating on the orthotics that is for the foot but it's going to be more unilateral you can concentrate on some orthotic that is going to concentrate on the knee joint um but still i would like to remind that this presentation is ex exclusively focusing only on clinical versus radiological findings and i do emphasize that i am not an expert in managing hamstring injuries though i have treated hamstring injuries as a part of my research and as a part of my clinical experience but i am not a specialist in treating pediatric hamstring injuries with uh, uh, people with disabilities or especially if it's of neurological concern thank you for that so any other questions you're most welcome but still i didn't address exactly what orthotic you should use you can go and read it okay but never forget that whenever you're going to use any orthotic for long time 
it is going to promote abnormal motor control. So when you rely on authority for a long time, it is going to affect the motor control. It might cause abnormal motor control strategies. So obviously, there's always active strategies that's, that should be the implementation most of the time at the first line of defense for a physio. Maybe it could be used for acute corrections, but if you want to use it for chronic conditions for a long time, it might end up in promoting abnormal motor control. So don't forget it. Ah, hello. Uh, I think few participants were not able to uh, open that uh, attachment. I'm just resending it again. Before you leave the meeting, please ensure that you download that material for your reference. Do you have any other questions? I think we don't have any other questions. OK, so there are no questions, but I still I, I like to I like to point out why I had such a topic to present. My intention was not to highlight only hamstring injuries. Most of the time we encounter in the clinics that sometimes patient comes with imaging diagnosis, whichever is the problem. Uh, my only suggestion is whenever you're a clinician, you need not rely on the imaging diagnosis all the time. Most of the time patients may present with structural abrasions in the imaging diagnosis but they may not present with clinical symptoms of the disease. So that's the most worrying thing, especially when you look at athletes or people with um, uh, repetitive strain injuries and uh, of uh, injuries of chronic nature. So radiological abrasions are quite common and you need not treat any patient just based on a radiological diagnosis. It is always an adjunct for clinical correlation based on your clinical findings and clinical reasoning. So not only for hamstring injuries, in case of any other injury, Always, you need not rely on imaging diagnosis. If at all needed, you can go for it, or else you need to rely on the clinical findings and clinical reasoning to treat a patient and not rely on radiological imaging. You can find several studies on shoulder showing that people present with abnormal uh, rotator cuff tear, but still they may not have symptoms of it, especially you can look at cricketer, brawlers, or people using shoulder more for their occupation or sports. It's called quite common, and there have been many studies on shoulder too. So my take home message for all of you is that clinical Im imaging can in imaging diagnosis is based uh, or record only for some cases, but not for all the cases. And most of the times you might present with structural observations in the imaging diagnosis, which is not always correlating with the clinical diagnosis. But treat the patient based on the clinical diagnosis. Just don't blindly go with the radiological diagnosis. So that's the one I want to emphasize. And that's the whole notion of such a topic today. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to thank Manipal College of Health Professions Alumni Network, uh, Dr. Selvam for coordinating this, uh, Professor Maya and Professor Vaishali and all of the faculty who have been supporting me all the time. And I could see some of the familiar faces attending today. I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to all of them. Uh, thank you one and all. If you have a doubt, just feel free to write an email to me or just get in touch with me. I would appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ashokan, for uh, say, extending your support um, in uh, having this uh, webinar session organized. Uh, so on behalf of uh, HOD and faculty members, uh, I thank you uh, for staying connected with your alma mater and um, best wishes for all your endeavors. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Look thank forward you. to catching with all of you on some other occasion. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye for now. Thanks. Okay. Bye.